Hello, welcome to Eye on Africa here on France 24. I'm Rochelle Harrison Pless. Coming up. It's been dubbed a frontier of peace and friendship. Ethiopia and Eritrea reopen key border crossings for the first time in 20 years. The former enemies strengthening their rapprochement with this landmark move. I'll have more details with our correspondent in just a few moments. Tears and tributes for former UN chief Kofi Annan, his body lying in state in the Ghanaian capital, as the public says a final farewell before his funeral later this week. And Bamba Chakula, it's Swahili, forget your food, but it's also the name of a rapidly expanding electronic cash transfer program that's revolutionizing UN food handouts for refugees in Kenya. Thanks for joining us. Former foes well on the path to peace. Ethiopia and Eritrea have reopened two key border crossings for the first time in 20 years. The landmark move cementing the reconciliation between the once bitter enemies. On Tuesday, emotional reunion scenes erupted between people on both sides of the border two decades after they were separated by a bloody war. Well, for more on this story, let's bring in Tom Gardner, Addis Ababa correspondent for The Economist. Tom, uh, this is the next step in Ethiopia and Eritrea's rapprochement. Describe the atmosphere for us. Um, well, this isn't the first historic moment of the peace process, but it's, it's perhaps the most concrete of all in that soldiers are finally putting down, down their guns and shaking hands. And I think the fact that it's happened on Ethiopian New Year today uh, makes it especially emotional for both sides, uh, particularly here in Ethiopia, obviously. And, uh, in Addis, uh, Addis Ababa, the capital, the, the atmosphere is generally very high surge at the moment. People are very hopeful about the situation in the country overall. Uh, Prime Minister Abbey is still enormously popular, and I think today's um, events are uh, sort of the icing on the cake. You, you find stickers with his face, the posters with his face, and with uh, President Azaias' face all over the city, which gives you a bit of a sense of how much this means to people. Uh, and uh, the border itself has seems to have been a hugely emotional day which is something that we've been, uh, you know, thousands turned up to watch and, uh, and families are being reunited. Uh, this is stuff we've seen um, since the first life resumed uh, in July, but it's particularly meaningful, I think, for these communities along the border, because they're the ones that bore much of the brunt or most of the brunt of the Cold War over the last two decades. Well, what can you tell us about the, the significance of the, the reopening of these two border crossings and, and what's next for the, the two countries? Um, well, the crossing at Zalambeta is, is on the main trade route li linking uh, Eritrea's capital of Mara with uh, Mekele, uh, the, the capital of Ethiopia's northern uh, Tigray region. Um, Burde's crossing point, which is also open today, is, is, is important because it should allow uh, facilitate access to, Ethi to Eritrea's port of Assad. And you know, port access for Ethiopia is, is, is key in all this. Uh, it should be noted, however, that neither of these two towns are uh, disputed in the way that uh, Flashpoint, the Flashpoint town of Badme was, and that, among with other towns, uh, still remains to be dealt with. And um, if you troops still need to withdraw, and I don't think Eritreans will be fully at ease until that, until that Badme is, is at last handed over. So that's going to be a key step going forward. Uh, after that, um, well, Abby said today that, that forces based along the border on both sides will be moved back into camps receive some sort of lively, livelihood training. It sounds like some sort of demobilization program, but it's not entirely clear uh, what exactly. And it also needs to be, uh, it's yet to make clear what exactly the border crossing regime will be for local communities along the frontier. I mean, ideally, they, they should be allowed to, they should be given special prerogatives to, to, to use local markets and visit families on either side of the border. That needs to be clarified soon. We also need a security on visas, on technical issues like uh, currency conversion, tariffs, and on the Eritrean side, an answer to the question whether they, or, or which Eritreans will be allowed uh, permits to cross into Ethiopia, because as it sounds, very, very few of them are, are allowed to travel abroad. OK, Tom, thanks very much for following that story for us. Tom Gardner, the uh, Addis Ababa correspondent for The Economist. Next, his funeral is still two days away, but already hundreds of mourners are paying their last respects to former UN chief Kofi Annan. His body arrived in the Ghanaian capital on Monday before a state funeral and private burial on Thursday. The late statesman and Nobel Peace laureate died on the 18th of August at the age of 80. Nicolas Germain has more. Kofi Annan's coffin is now in Accra's International Conference Centre. 
The body of the former UN Secretary General was flown from Switzerland to Ghana on Monday. He died last month after a brief illness. He was 80. All day mourners paid tribute to the Nobel Peace Prize laureate. He was the first black African to become to the UN Secretary General. Hopefully, coming from this soil, Ghana, and I'm a Ghanaian. He's my, he's my old man, he's my dad. Known for being a soft-spoken diplomat, he received praise from citizens across Africa, like here in Ivory Coast. Kofi Annan. Kofi Annan was the pride of Ghanaians, but he was also the pride of Africa and the world, because seeing an African in that job who performs brilliantly, it's not something that happens to everybody. But there is one African country where he is not fondly remembered, and that is Rwanda. The Genocide Museum in Kigali reminds visitors that in 1994, during the massacres, he was head of the UN peacekeepers. The commander on the ground, Romeo Dallaire, sent him a telegram urging a move against arms caches being built by Hutu extremists. But Anan failed to act. It is a critical information that uh, if it had been shared by all members of, of the UN Security Council and probably all members of the UN, probably genocide could have been averted. That is what most Rwandans I think remember uh, with Kofi Annan. Annan later acknowledged he should have done more to help prevent the genocide. On Thursday, many world leaders are expected to attend his funeral. A private burial will then be held in the capital's military cemetery. Zimbabwe has declared a cholera emergency in the capital, Harare. According to the country's health minister, 20 people have died and more than 2,000 have been infected by drinking contaminated water. Obadiah Moyo said that the number of cases is growing every day and that the epidemic is spreading to other parts of the country. It sparked fears of a repeat of the massive cholera outbreak in 2008, which killed more than 4,000 people. Next, South Africa is on the brink of a war zone. Those words from the country's police minister in the wake of new crime statistics. The murder rate has been climbing for six consecutive years. Between April 2017 and March 2018, more than 20,300 people were murdered in South Africa. That's around 57 killings per day and a 7% increase on the previous year's figure. Police Minister Becky Sele says those soaring numbers reveal that law enforcement has taken its eye off the ball when it comes to crime fighting efforts. South Africa has one of the highest murder rates in the world with many killings linked to gang violence in Western Cape province. To Kenya now, where the World Food Programme hands out nearly 95,000 tonnes of food each year. In the country's refugee camps, an expanding Cash for Food initiative is not only lightening the logis logistical rather load, but giving people freedom of choice. And with the uptick in mobile phone ownership, electronic cash transfers could be the future of UN food distribution for refugees around the world. Bastien Renouy and Julia Steers sent us this report. 185,000 refugees live here, in Kakuma and Kolobie, neighboring camps in Kenya. They depend on the UN's World Food Program for monthly rations. Aid is typically distributed like this, but change has come to the camps in the form of an electronic cash transfer program. 250 shopkeepers have registered as merchants in the initiative Bamba Chakula, Swahili for Get Your Food. Uh, tomatoes. Tomatoes. Um, yeah, 50. 50. Yeah. And Bamba Chakula has helped both local and refugee traders to grow their businesses. I've gone a step forward because even from that small, I, I was capable to, capable to build up this big shop. So at first, even as we were fearing these refugees when we started working, but we came to realize they are just people like us. The program, funded in part by the EU and France, gives people more choice and control over what they eat, crucial for their health and nutrition. You are free to choose all the food you like, and then you can exchange not all the type of food you want, you can get it, which is good. You can balance your diet from there. 60% of food handouts are still predetermined shelf-stable items. Newly arrived refugees depend on distributions like this until they're registered for Bamba Chakula, a program WFP believes gives them a chance to benefit from new technology. Bamba Chakula for us represents innovation, it represents an opportunity to do things differently. This is also part of our strategy. New technologies can bring new type of assistance. 
A more effective, efficient humanitarian aid program that WFP hopes to expand across Africa and around the world. And finally, Chain of Hope is best known for providing life-saving heart surgery for thousands of children around the globe. The charity also builds specialist heart clinics in developing countries in desperate need of vital cardiac services. Well, one such clinic has just opened in the Malian capital of Bamako, and our correspondents Katerina Vatotsi, Christelle Pierre and Hamza Ubi were there. <laughs> Fanta is six and much smaller than she should be. At birth, she was diagnosed with a heart defect, but it's taken this long for it to get operated on. It's much better that she gets the operation here. We can come and visit, we're all together, the whole family. I'm very happy for my daughter. Fanta is patient number one in this brand new state-of-the-art cardiothoracic ward. It took two and a half years to build thanks to a private donation. To operate here costs a fraction of what was spent sending children to France and saves families from weeks of separation. It's not easy to take a child, bring them to France with all these different conditions. Here we don't have to worry about them, coping in a new environment. For now, Malian doctors and nurses work alongside French teams, but eventually they'll work independently. Our strategy is simple. We build, we equip and we train. We can see hundreds and hundreds of children being treated here in the years to come. Treating children locally means more can get the help they need. Open for just a day, and there's already a waiting list here of more than 2,500 children who need heart surgery. I'll be back in around 45 minutes with more Eye on Africa. Stay with us here on France 24. Lots more news coming up. North Korean dictator Kim Jong-un wants his country to enter a new era. Massive efforts are underway to modernize the peninsula and reduce its dependence on some of its partners. Local engineers are the new heroes, while farmers and factory workers are relegated to the background. But is this plan yielding concrete results? Or is it the swan song of a regime on the verge of collapse in the face of crippling international sanctions? Reporters on France 24 and France24.com.